radio TV phono nut here and what we have torn apart is a, an El Cheapo Electro brand stereo probably from the early to mid 80's all this is is an AM FM tuner miraculously it does have FM stereo sound believe it or not and this El Cheapo slot cassette player this is the same cassette mechanism that was used in a lot of cheapo car stereos and pretty much all of the cheapo Thomas and Crosley reproduction pieces of garbage that have cassette player capability. I know whenever I was 13 I received a Thomas Cathedral for Christmas that had one of those uh, one of these types of cassette mechanisms in it. It wasn't no time before it started eating tapes. And what's so disappointing about this unit is it so cheap that it doesn't even have an auxiliary input? Like I said, all you have is AM FM tuner and this cheap old cassette player. This is the kind of thing that if you were a kid back in the 80s and if you sold sold a hundred thousand dollars worth of uh, world's finest chocolate candy bars, you'd receive one of these as a prize. And the reason I say that is because when I was in middle school in the late 80s we had to sell those candy bars and they gave us a this nice booklet of prizes you could win based on how many candy bars you sold and it seems like all of the electronic stuff was all electro brand and Yorks and that kind of junk I've got this cassette mechanism out and I had it in my head that I was going to replace the belt and I found this bag of El Cheapo cassette belts that I got from somewhere. These are certainly not high quality belts, but for cheap junk like this it'll be okay. But then lo and behold I pull it all apart and discover that this mechanism uses a flat belt and there's not a flat belt in this bag to be found. So I flip the belt around and we're going to clean all the gunk off of the uh, pulley here and just see what happens but most likely what is going to take place with this is we're going to uh, disable the cassette mechanism and we're going to install an auxiliary jack on the back of the uh, stereo and attach it to where the uh, tape would go into this uh, selector switch here and that will make this thing more versatile than having this El Cheapo cassette deck that even if it worked it would not work all that well so but we'll try cleaning it up and just seeing what happens. Yeah, this pulley has rust on it. It's not just belt gunk, it's rust. And I cleaned it down a little bit, but I'm not so sure this mechanism is even worth fooling with. Now, on another note, our longtime electronics parts house that has been around since 1960 closed its doors for good this week. They actually started out as a parts store and then in later years they added a, a separate store for selling audio and video products, stereos and TVs and that kind of thing. And then when the uh, gentleman who owned the whole thing died, they closed down the parts house location and combined it with the stereo and video store and that's pretty much when everything went to pot. Well, now they've shut the whole thing down, and there's no more Radio Shack, there's no more electronics, parts houses, or anything left here. So, if I need something, I'm going to have to go order it. Now, if the parts house was still here, I might have gone down there to pick up a belt for this thing, but I'm not going to order a belt that costs 10 12 $14 plus shipping to put on a cassette mechanism that probably won't even work right anyway and I'm not going to order one of those cheap belt assortments from China that will probably take six months to get here and then that'll probably be the only belt I'll ever use out of the assortment so we're just going to put this old belt back on I flipped it around and cleaned it up clean this up a little bit and we're just going to see what happens but I think we're going to just patch into the selector switch with an auxiliary jack and that way you can plug a external cassette player or CD player or, 
or even a turntable that has a preamp built into it into this thing and make it far more useful. Uh, it, the belt fits, but it's it barely stays on there. I don't think it'll work too well under the load of a tape being played. So let's let's put everything back together and see what we need to do to patch into this selector switch. Here's a pair of old JBL computer speakers, not to be confused with a good JBL name. This is just a case of some somebody licensing the uh, rights to use the brand name, like happens so often, but a pair of old JBL branded computer speakers that I gutted the amplifier out of, and I'm just going to use them on this stereo. It's the best problems you might have, family owned and operated. Or if they deserve. Where do you go from here? Alright, let's try it on cassette and see what happens. I don't think anything's happening. I don't even hear any movement. Okay, it finally took off. I think the motor switch was not making good contact, but as you can hear, it sounds like crap. There's no way we can use this, so... Okay, this is our tape preamp board that takes the incoming signal from the tape head and amplifies it to a line level source to be fed to the rest of the chassis so we'll just disconnect the output of this preamp board connect our auxiliary input jack to it and we ought to be set much to my surprise this thing uses discrete transistors for the audio outputs usually these cheap stereos that were made in the 80s had a little IC and that was it alright green is our right output Yellow is our left output, and of course black is common ground, our orange is our voltage input, and then these are the inputs from the head, which we don't need to worry about that. So this is going to be relatively simple. Okay, we have our necessary wires disconnected, black ground, yellow left, green right. I think I'm going to mount a terminal strip here under this screw and connect these wires to the terminal strip and then we'll use some shielded audio cable to run from here to some uh, RCA jacks that we'll have mounted on the rear of the uh, of the set and then we'll be good to go. Here's our terminal strip and our wires connected and I oriented things so if somebody wants to maybe 30 years from now restore this back to original they can take the yellow wire off of this wrap it around this left terminal take the green wire off of this terminal, connect it to this right terminal, and connect the black wire to the ground terminal here. Now I need to go round up some insulated audio cable and connect here. Here's an RCA cable, which I've got plenty of, so we can just cut the plugs off of this, and this will do fine for our uh, audio cable. Okay, wires are soldered in place. Now all we got to do is put it back together and I'm going to cable clamp the cable somewhere inside of the unit to give it some strain relief. Okay, just for testing purposes, I have the RCA cable coming out of the back of the stereo and connected to this cassette deck. When we're all done, I'm going to mount an RCA jack on the back panel here. But we've still got a few more things we got to do here. Okay. You can see how loud and distorted that is in compared to the radio. So the uh the cassette deck is severely overdriving this, so we're gonna have to pad down the uh signal so so it won't be so hot going into the amplifier and we'll do that at the uh jacks. So I need to experiment with some resistor and and or capacitor values to get that signal down so it I want the line level signal to be about the same as what the radio is or maybe a tad bit louder, but this is way overdriven. Do you agree, Mr. Kissinger? Thank you, Henry 
Kissinger and Vice President Agnew. Okay, what I did was used a couple of 220K ohm resistors, one each, one wired in series with each hot lead, and that seems to have brought it down to an acceptable level. How did you finalize your agreement with Senator McGovern? I mean, this thing is never going to sound like a high-fidelity system. This is just a cheapo stereo, and we're trying to make it a little more useful. It's designed to make noise. That's it. Fine. Having flashbacks to whenever I was recording everything on cassettes. Fast forward. Fast forward again. Whoops, went too far. Rewind. If you was real uptown, you had one of those fancy cassette decks with a music search feature on it, so... I need to go get a commercially recorded cassette instead of this old tape recorded off of old worn-out records. Here we are with a pre-recorded cassette. And that's about as good as we're going to go with it. Okay, I just moved my tape over to this side and it sounds a lot better. Apparently this side has an issue, probably just needs to be cleaned. But yeah, that sounds good. Okay, there's our resistors. Now let's see if we can squeeze all of this through this hole here and then and bolt the jack to the back cover and then this project should be complete. Okay, here we are with our auxiliary jack bolted in place. Auxiliary right and left. Same orientation, same direction as the speaker jack. Right, left, right, left. And the reason I chose to put the auxiliary jack over here instead of over here by the speakers is because I wanted to keep our signal cable on this side of this on this side of the radio. I didn't want to run a cable all the way over here through across the power supply area and the AC input and have possible hum pick up, which we use shielded cable anyway, so that shouldn't but shouldn't be too much of an issue, but just to be on the safe side. I just went ahead and put the auxiliary jack here. This is Walter Funkite back on campus. One of the students has an important question. All right. That's it. Now this thing should be a lot more versatile now that it has an auxiliary input. A student has something to Governor Wallace. 